Hey, it's Ken Gagney with YouTube channel GameBits on the IndieCider podcast where I play indie games and then interview the developer. This week I am playing Emily is Away. This is a choose-your-own-adventure text game framed as a series of instant messenger conversations. I'm going to go ahead and reset the game. I've already played it all the way through. I'm going to start from the beginning. And then after a few examples of the gameplay, I'm going to be interviewing the developer, Mr. Kyle Seeley. So let us start with chapter one, senior year of high school, 2002. I was already out of college by that point, but nonetheless, screen name. I could type in my actual AIM screen name, which I still have, but I don't want everybody watching this video to start tweeting at me or I am in me. So I am going to go with uh, Xenon there, uh, one of my favorite elements on the periodic table. Ken. All right. Doesn't ask for anything else like gender or whatever. That's just going to go ahead and sign in. I can minimize this. Kind of looks like Windows. Uh, click on the time, sign in, if I close the X button, it quits me out. So I'm just going to go ahead and say, and choose my icon, Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings. going to go with uh, L-O-T-R, apply. Here are my friends who are online. Oh, Emerly has signed on. I can click on her cold play. No, I can click on this little button down here to see her profile, some cold play lyrics, as always. And I don't really know cold play, but... I get to choose which one of these three salutations to begin with. I can click on it or push the number key. I'm going to click Howdy. And then there's a cursor here. It almost as if it's asking me to type something. And I can press whatever keys on the keyboard I want. And it will just start typing stuff. So I'm going to push A, 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 A. See? It just automatically fills in. And when it's done, I can hit Return or push this little button. Hey, I love those movies too. And I can even change my background. Ooh, very appropriate for Halloween, which is the date I'm actually recording this. There we go. I'm going to just click number three. And just start type, 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 type. Return. Well, no feces. I'm just listening to music. Do you like Coldplay? Uh, do I like Coldplay? I actually, to be perfectly honest, don't know. I don't really know. I've never really listened to them. Emily will remember that. Uh-oh, I've made a choice. You should definitely listen to them. I really like them. Their lyrics are in my info. And so they are. Ta-da! Are you going to Travis's party tonight? Um, I don't know Travis, so maybe. Maybe. I haven't decided. You should go. It'd be no fun without you. Oh, I know. It is end of year. Uh, time flew by. High school does do that, doesn't it? College is so close. I know. I'm excited. I'm so over this school. You know Brad from our math class? He won't stop messaging me right now. He's a dick, too. I've never liked that Brad. Although I don't know what I mean by two. Lol, you're so funny. Hey, I'm glad you think so. Just one month to graduation. Oh man, we're so old. I'm not really sure you can say that if you're only 18, but I'm so excited for college. Yeah, I'm so excited for college. Did you pick a school yet? Also notice that very subtle background noise of like the old CPU and the floppy drive and the hard disk spinning and reading. That's pretty cool. Anything's better than high school. So what kind of school am I going to go to? Well, in real life, I went to an engineering school. Wish I'd gone to an art school, but here I am. I'm sure I'll figure it out. And I made a decision. I chose to do that. So right there in that IM window is where and when I chose what college to go to. Emily is deleting. Emily is typing. Absolutely, Emily. Nothing could ever keep me from talking to you. You're my best... No, you're one of my best friends. She'll remember that. Aw, thanks, Emerly35. Yes, I will definitely be at the party. I chose to attend. Awesome! 
I don't know who Jules is, but if you're on your way out, I'm not going to keep you hanging around just to tell me who Julie is. Although I could have maybe said, like, say hello to Julie for me. So once Emily is away, that's the end of the chapter, and the next chapter is a full year later. So this is a simulation of an experience of a relationship that grows and evolves over several years of high school and college told entirely in the framework of Instant Messenger. There have been books written in this framework, and now this is a game that does that. So now I'm going to speak with Mr. Kyle Seeley all about why he chose this framework, what experiences he's trying to capture and relate to other players, and much, much more. If you want to listen to just the audio of the podcast, you can listen to it at IndieCider.net, where you can subscribe in iTunes, Stitcher, or TuneIn, or leave a review on iTunes. If you want to do that, or give a thumbs up or a comment on this YouTube video, that'd be much appreciated. Thanks for watching, and stay tuned. Today I'm chatting with Mr. Kyle Seeley, creator of Emily Is Away. Hello, Kyle. Hey, Ken. How you doing? Good. How are you? Good. Now, if I understand correctly, you're based right here in the Boston area, yes? Yeah, I'm from Boston. Excellent. And we first bumped into each other at Game Loop, held at the Nerd Center, the Microsoft Nerd Center, back in August, and you were telling me about Emily Is Away at that time, and then I saw you at Boston Fig as well. Yeah, yeah. It was, it's been great uh, in the Boston community. And as I understand, you just got back from Indicate as well, right? Yeah, that was that was surreal, uh, going out there. It was a, a ton of fun. Yeah, so that was held in October, all the way out in California. Did you go out there specifically to show off Emily is Away? Yeah, I got into the uh, Digital Selects portion of their uh, showcase. Wow, congratulations. Yeah, thanks. So I want to talk a lot more about your experience at these festivals at Boston Fig and Indicate, but let's talk a bit first about Emily is Away. So this is a sort of a choose-your-own-adventure game, a text adventure set in the context of an instant messenger discussion with Emily over the course of high school and college. It's set at first in the year 2002 and spans about four or five years. How autobiographical is this experience? This game is based on my life. So uh, what that means is is I kind of took my own experience uh, in uh, chatting with people on instant messengers when I was in middle school. Um, kind of my experience going through college, and I kind of uh, took a lot of uh, freedom in, in rearranging everything um, and and basing stuff off of that experience to come up with the final story. Um, so there's no one-to-one -one ratio between the final story in the game and my life. Like, no characters are people that I know, and no events actually happen to me that are in the game, but more that I, I wanted to create a narrative that is kind of universal to people from my generation. Um, and that means, um, you know, the, the narrative of someone growing up, um, having a friend from high school and going into college um, and, and, and kind of uh, the hardships of that and the hardships of keeping a, a friendship that has kind of dwindled um, is kind of universal to people who have gone through college. Um, and I really wanted to create a story that was very relatable for, for a lot of people. And I also wanted to set this story in uh, an interface that was very nostalgic for a lot of people that grew up from my generation, which would be AOL and Instant Messenger. So at that point, you were using IM, not like ICQ or GChat or Jabber. Right. So I actually, I graduated high school in 2010. So the story is a few years before me. Um, I, I used AOL and Instant Messenger a lot in middle school. And so I'm trying to capture kind of like my experience in, in middle school, coming directly home from school and going right on AIM to talk to people uh, in this game. That's really interesting. I wasn't aware of that temporal discrepancy. I assume you weren't still using IM in college and after college, were you? By that point, hadn't we evolved into other chat interfaces? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I used it. I think I stopped using IM in high school, actually. But I, I kind of moved the story back a little bit to kind of set it in uh, IM because I wanted to tell a story about college because I think that's a, a very universal story and it's one that um, a lot of people can relate to. Um, and so I moved my college experience or the game's college experience back in time. And then I kind of stretched the longevity of AOL and Messenger a little bit further so that it would make sense with the story. So if I may ask, if this story was actually set in 2010, what interface would you have used? Um, you know, I don't know, because at that point, Facebook had become so huge. I think that to so get this, like, the correct uh, slice of time that I wanted to use, which was instant messengers, because it's a very different interaction, instant messengers, than, than like, Facebook chat, right? Or, or texting, right? Because texting took off um, in, in the early 2000s as well. Um, I really wanted to get that feel of instant messengers where it's, it's, it's 
it's kind of a unique thing. So I don't think this, this story would have been possible if I, I used um, something from my own experience in college. That's really interesting. So I, I understand the ways in which it is autobiographical, but it's melding a lot of different eras together to create something unique. Yeah, yeah. Did you examine any old chat logs in order to lift the text out and actually get it the, that sense of script accurate? Yeah, so um, I, I, I did examine some old chat logs. I also looked at people's old um, Facebook profiles because people haven't touched their quotes, you know, or their about me's since this, this time period, since they first created Facebook. And so that, that really helped a lot. Um, also, my own memory of what people's what wave messages would be or um, uh, what their profiles looked like uh, really helped the story. And and that's kind of a it's it's kind of a fun thing because I'm not actually a good writer. Like um, this is the first game I've ever written, and so this wasn't actually really writing for me. It was kind of just like remembering how people acted and then just changing their words to fit the narrative. Did you have any sort of consultants to? run the story past to make sure you were getting both parts of the conversation accurate because this is a fairly traditional binary interaction, at least it was when I played it, and I don't know that I could accurately write what a female friend of mine from high school going into college might behave like, for example. Right. So I didn't have any consultants specifically. Um, I did playtest this game a lot. Uh, the IGC has been awesome. Boston Indies community has been awesome. Playcrafting has been awesome uh, in the in the the Boston community to help me um, kind of like figure out what the pain points in my story were and then I'd go back and change that um, and that's stuff where like the story didn't flow correctly or the characters weren't believable and I'd have to go back and, and kind of change the um, the actual text uh, to, to kind of fit like uh, a better story um, and then the game is uh, gender neutral on purpose um, so it doesn't force you into being a male it doesn't force you into being a female um, it doesn't change much based on your gender, so uh, it doesn't take sexual orientation into account, it doesn't take any of that into account. Um, and it's more, I think, uh, you can kind of get out of it what you what you want. Um, so, like, if it was a female playing the main character, then uh, there would be different nuances for the story, for sure, right? And the same thing if it was a male playing the character, um, then there'd be different nuances to the story. And I kind of tried to leave all those nuances out so you could kind of experience the story in more of a raw form. What made you decide to implement the sort of user input you did where the player types on the keyboard and these words pop up as opposed to a more traditional, say, Twine adventure where you make a choice, it presents you all the narrative that leads up to the next choice, and your only interactions are in those rare moments of choose your own adventure? So... Um, one of the one of the things I wanted to do with this game was is capture the um, the reformatting done in instant messaging in chat, um, and so that's like when you would type a message uh, out that would be your thoughts, and then maybe it's too forward, so you go back and you kind of rearrange the words to to kind of be more of a general statement, and that that's a really important thing with I think instant messengers that that people do even now today with like text messages, right? Where they might type something out and then say, "Oh wait, I don't think this sounds bad," and then go back and change it. Um, and that's something I really wanted to play around with. Um, at the beginning, though, this this was just you clicked your choice, and then that message would type at itself out on the screen, um, and so there'd be no keyboard interaction at all. And uh, that was in the early prototype, and I was showing it to um, Alex from Robot Loves Kitty. They did uh, Legend, of, Legend of Dungeon, um, and she's kind of this like fun, bubbly girl, and she was like, you know, I'd really enjoy it if I could type out, and it would make this animation go faster, the typing animation. And I tried that, and it didn't really feel right because it was weird. Uh, and then I tried the one-to-one -one ratio where every letter is a keystroke, and that felt really good. And I think that's how I stumbled upon that mechanic. Yeah, it's sort of a nice compromise between Choose Your Adventure and a game where you actually have freeform input like Eliza. Have you ever played a version of Eliza? I've never played Eliza, but I, I do know of Text Parsers. Another game that that is uh, a lot like is the game Facade. Um, and yeah, it's been really interesting to show this at festivals because people come up thinking that it's a text parser, like a natural language processor, and it's it's not. <laughs> hmm. I've never heard of Facade. I'll have to look that up. There will be a link in the show notes. Is that similar to Eliza? Yeah, it's a natural language processor. I actually got to meet the um, designers of Facade at Indicate, and this, that was really interesting. Oh, very cool. Yeah, Eliza is something that I played on the Apple II when I was a little kid. It was developed decades before that by... 
uh, somebody at MIT, and it was an attempt to pass the Turing test where you would be talking to the computer and you'd tell it how it, you feel and it would respond as if it was a psychotherapist. And uh, it, it was really interesting, especially as a little kid, to try to see how a computer would interact with a human. And obviously Emily's Way is very different because it's a little bit more scripted on both ends, but it still gives that sense of interacting with somebody. I really feel like there is an Emily, even though it is just a computer program or a game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, yeah, I really wanted to make Emily a very believable character. Um, and I think that a lot of the different design decisions that I made in the interface and in the game uh, really helped that. What sort of software tools or programs did you use to manage all the different branching paths? I know that stuff like Twine is very good for this, but this doesn't seem to be a Twine game to me. You no, know, this, yeah, this game was made in uh, Unity, actually, because um, it's my most comfortable uh, game engine. And really, I just managed it in a text file um, and then imported that to a Unity uh, C-sharp file. Uh, it's kind of like a scripting language that I wrote specifically for this game to uh, do the branching paths. So I actually don't have like a very nice tool for the branching paths. It's mostly just in my head, like what choices mean what and what different options are dynamic. Oh, that's really interesting. When I previously interviewed Alchemy Labs for the game Discourse, they had a lot of different paths for that game. I think there were so many hundreds of possible endings that even they didn't know how many there were. And for, <laughs> for something like that, you really need to have it really well mapped out. Is it possible to say how many quote-unquote endings there are to Emily is Away? It's another one where it's kind of nebulous, right, because of the different dynamic choices you make as you get there. Um, I think not right now there's like four or five um, based on your choices dynamically. Uh, but it's another one, like, so Alchemy's version, they, uh, they had a bunch of um, uh, factors that would change based on every interaction you did in the game. Um, and Emily is kind of like that, where there's a lot of dynamic choices as you get close to the ending, and there's a lot of big story choices, so it's, it's kind of hard to say as well. I assume that the big story choices are the ones that say, Emily will remember that, sort of like when I was playing The Walking Dead. Yeah, yeah. So every time there's Emily will remember that, and there's also uh, prompts that will come up that says, like, you chose X. Every time that happens, there's, there's a big uh, dynamic change that's been made in the story. Why did you feel the need to telegraph that to the player as opposed to letting them not know when the major versus minor decisions were? Um, so I think that telegraphing that to the player allows them to kind of understand what the game is doing. Um, a major thing with um, interactive games, uh, branching narrative games like this, is um, when the player doesn't realize that they've made a choice and they have made a choice, right? That like, That's a really bad thing for the game because it means that I coded, you know, two times the content for this specific choice and the player doesn't even realize that it's happening um, and so they don't get that sense of power over the situation. They might just think, oh, this, this game's just going. And so calling out those choices help um, the player realize that this game is actually changing and it also helps the player realize, okay, this is actually a big decision that I just made and there will be big decisions in this game um, that I need to be aware of. Okay, I see. That makes sense. I imagine that a text-based game might be difficult to exhibit at an event like Boston Fig and Indiecade when there are so many other, perhaps flashier games, uh, n not necessarily more substantial, but just more visual games on the show mm -hmm. floor. What was the reception to Emily is Away at those events? It's It's been great showing Emily is Away at, at Fig and, and at other festivals. Um, I think that we almost or I try to use the flashiness or the unflashiness of a text-based game uh, to its advantage. Um, and so when I showed it Fig and when I showed it Indicate, I had, you know, these really old 4x3 Dell monitors. I had, like, a huge setup that kind of looked like a dorm room. Um, and I was really trying to push the fact that this is a game from an earlier time, that this is a game from, you know, the 90s. And I think that actually really helps elevate it because there's there's people that go to these festivals expecting flashy things. They They... They know flashy games, right? And then they see my game, and it's kind of this really weird text game. Um, and it kind of draws people in in, in that it's not flashy. Um, and I think that's actually really helped. And, you know, Boston Fig was great, and Indiecade was great for, for attendance um, and for people playing the game. It was, it's been a lot of fun. I totally see that. I don't know if you recall, but at Boston Fig, you asked me what other games I liked on the show floor. And I said, I don't know. I made a beeline for yours. Yours stood out, so this is the first game I've tried. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember that. That was that was great. That was a good experience. And as I also recall, you had a rather unusual promotion that you were handing out. You had the game on CD for users to try. Yep, I have uh, I have Emily's Away on CD. Um, I just recently went to Indiecade and I got rid of the rest of my copies um, that had the full release on them. And yeah, so I had them done up to kind of look like the uh, AOL trial discs from back in the day. As I pointed out back then, distributing the game on a CD is sort of a bold choice because most computers don't come with disk drives anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's more of a promotional promotional thing. If people want to get the game, they can download it. Um, but people like having like you know some swag from events, and so that's kind of like my version of swag, some 90s swag. I was able to download this game. As you mentioned, I went to Itch.io. It asked me how much I wanted to contribute, and I could name my own price, even if that price was $0. Mm-hmm. So you may not necessarily be recouping the cost of flying to California to exhibit this game at Indiecade. So, yeah. so, so what is the equation here? Yeah, so my this is this is my first major game in the indie game scene. And so going into this experience, I, I kind of try to set up goals for myself as in what do I want to get out of making this game? Um, and one of the things that I wanted to get out of making this game was just exposure. Um, it, this game was never meant to make me any money. Um, it was just a lot of hard work to try to try to explore this weird concept that I had for a game and then also try to just get exposure and try to go to these events and, and meet people um, and, and try to get people to understand um, this game and like kind of who I am as a as a game developer. And I think that it's gotten that in, uh, as a result of Indiecade and, and Fig and stuff and, and the, the money situation is just literally just that i just want to make enough money to recoup the costs of doing this not even enough money to pay myself just just enough money to uh, fly out to these events and kind of meet all these people and even if you don't necessarily recoup the cost it's helpful to look at it as an investment because you're playing the long game here and this is only your first game and there's going to be some upfront investment before you start capitalizing on this success and building a reputation Right, exactly. And it's also trying to get people to... Um, I also just kind of wanted to explore what a game is, right, with this game. It's a very weird kind of art game, and I, I kind of wanted to kind of... Uh, if, if I don't have to make money off this, it's it would, it's more fun to just kind of explore the possibility of a medium, right? If this is only your first game, what do we think the next ones will look like? I can't imagine there would be an Emily is Away 2, and I imagine that the market for a series of... IM simulators, if you were to move on to Jabber or Chichat, might be limited. So what <laughs> other kinds of games do you want to make based on this first one? I'm not actually sure right now. Uh, I have a lot of uh, nebulous kind of ideas floating around. Definitely something that is is as weird as Emily, um, if not more weird. I kind of like the idea of games as a medium being more about more than just uh, what kind of we see in the market today. So I want to keep exploring the bounds of the medium. And the game is on Steam Greenlight at the moment, is that correct? Yeah, it just it got through Greenlight uh, a few weeks ago, actually. Oh, excellent. Congratulations. Thanks. Yeah. So uh, one last question. You mentioned how this is something that you want players to empathize with, or at least to represent a sort of passage that they all went through at a certain point in their lives. But is there any thing in particular that you want players to walk away with like what do you want them to get out of this experience Mm -hmm. um so emily's away it's like it's a weird game because it's all about the characters and it's all about the story and it's a very personal story and these characters are very uh personalized characters um and so a lot of people have different reactions to the game based on their own past experiences um if there's so no interpretation of the game is wrong right because everybody has different past experiences everybody has different characters in their life that they're going to um, kind of project the story upon. Um, but if there's one thing that I want people to get out of this, it's just to relive their past and to kind of think about it again. Because I think that a lot of people kind of you know, know of their past but don't really uh, think about it that often. And so in order to do this, I wanted to use the, the aesthetic of AOL Instant Messenger to kind of make people nostalgic, prime people by thinking about their own past, who they talked to on AIM, um, what kind of conversations they had uh, with people on AIM. And then the story happens, and I want them to re- be able to relate their story back to their own past. Um, and then maybe come to realizations about their own past that they hadn't come to before. Um, I, I've gotten some really awesome emails and uh, direct messages on Twitter from people who who have really connected to the story and, and have said, you know, hey, this this game actually helped me come to a realization about my past that I hadn't come to before and it's actually like made me feel better about my life 
and that's that's awesome i mean that's obviously like the best thing that this game could ever do so um just being able to relate this game to your past and then trying to think critically about the choices you made in the game and then also in your own life wow that's awesome yeah it's it's a great moment (laughs) would you like to hear what i got out of the game yeah go for it (laughs) The game is set in 2002, and I was already out of college at that point, but we did have IM when I was in college. Uh, It wasn't set in the Windows environment that this game is, because I am, and always have been, an Apple user. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that I ever had these exact experiences of sort of a, a high school crush that I kept in touch with, but... Nonetheless, the interactions I had with Emily, I I don't know how or why, but they seemed to strike so close to home where there were these incredibly awkward moments and I would type something and then delete it, especially toward the end of the game. I was making choices that I don't think I would ever have the courage to actually type in real life. And sure enough, in the game, I would type it and then erase it and replace it with something completely different. Mm -hmm. And there were times when I was laughing my head off. There were times when I was absolutely cringing it was just, oh, but in a totally good way because I wasn't cringing at like how bad the game was. I was cringing at how awkward the conversation was and, and not in a, this is n- so unnatural, people wouldn't say this. It's because it was exactly what would happen. <laughs> yeah. And it was probably the most fun I've had playing a game in quite some time. Thank you. Uh, that's that's a great compliment. <laughs> yeah, so like when I show this game at festivals, people the first thing they look up at like they say, "Oh, is this a game based in AOL and some messenger?" And they're like, "Yeah." And then they walk over and they start looking at the conversation and they're like, "Jesus Christ, like the 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 memories that I have are so uncomfortable right now. Like you're making me feel so awkward." And that's just a great feeling, right? To bring people back to their awkward teenage years. <laughs> um and and so that's that that's been really fun with the game. Yeah, when I first played the game at Boston Fig, I only played the first chapter, so I didn't even walk away from that experience understanding that the game spans multiple years. I just thought it was a very much more limited uh, slice of time. And when I saw that it spanned four or five years, I'm like, wow, that's really interesting. I mean, not only that I am would last that long, but also that this relationship <laughs> would last that long across a single medium. And just seeing how people's icons and profiles would change and their taste in music and just the what the very narrow window you get into people's lives based on what they choose to say and not say is something that we still have nowadays with facebook even with email and i i really like how that is captured and represented in i am in emily's way thank you <laughs> yeah so remind us where we can find this game online so this game, you can get this game um, on Itch right now. It'll be released on Steam in the next month, November. You can go to emilyisaway.com, and it'll have links to both of those websites. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kyle Seeley. Uh, thanks, Ken.